The epistle reading is Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with the first verse. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old received divine approval. By faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God and that what is seen was made from things which do not appear. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place where he was to receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was to go. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jason, heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Those all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he, was prepared, he has prepared for them a city. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Four years ago, Lisa and I moved. Uh, we lived near South Park for 15 years, and then we moved to Plaza Midwood. And just dumb luck, uh, our next door neighbor in the house that we chose, what a great neighbor. Uh, his name is Udo. Um, Udo, we call Udo the mayor of Plaza Midwood. He knows everybody, he knows everybody's business. His entertainment value is just off the chart all the time. He's from Germany, and uh, Udo's great. And recently, Udo was really excited because he, he found in his yard, this is actually amazing, he found a ring in his yard on the ground. And it's not just any ring, it was his father's ring. And his father died 20, 25 years ago, I don't know. And so. Udo's father had given him this ring, had an inscription inside, and Udo had lost this ring 12 years ago. And he tried to find it out there in the yard, a metal detector and everything, just could not locate the ring. And then the other day, he's out there where he has walked, I have walked, the mowing people have walked, everybody's gone by there so many times, and then there's the ring. Udo was very excited. When he got it resized, he's wearing it. What an amazing discovery. What an amazing recovery. I would say that this Hebrews chapter 11, we hear just a portion of it, it's a long passage. We might think of this as an old treasure. It's been lying around all this time, and finally we find it, and we pick it up, and it changes everything. It changes everything. The author of Hebrews 11, as if he's thumbing through Scripture, uh, sort of on a roll call of the heroes of faith. And the amazing thing about the roll call of the heroes of faith is how unheroic the heroes of faith are. So we'll we can take them one at a time. Abel gets a name there. Well, the only thing we know about Abel is that he was in history's uh, first episode of severe sibling rivalry, and it cost him his life, right? His brother Cain is upset with God, not Abel, but he takes it out on Abel. I mean, that's how it goes in the world all the time, isn't it? You become the victim of somebody who's upset about something. Abel? What makes him heroic? Noah. Uh, the Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody. He built him an arky, arky. We tend to think Noah's great. I read a book by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. 
a couple of years ago. He said, Noah was the worst leader in human history, right? Noah said, come, we need to get on the ark. Not one person followed his lead and got on that ark. Uh, Rabbi Sachs called him the man in the fur coat. He said, if you wear a fur coat, you keep yourself warm. If you build a fire, you make others warm. Noah just kept it to himself. Uh, Abraham is in the story, and Abraham has his heroic moments when he does noble things for God, but then most of the time, Abraham's just a big uh, chicken. He's an embarrassment to himself, to us, to his wife. It's tough. Abraham. Moses is called by God to change the world. And Noah ducks and bobs and weaves to try to get out of it, and then he's trying to lead the people, and he's just frustrated with them all the time, losing his temper. And then he died right before he achieved his life goal. David, King David, is mentioned there. Some people make David into be this real spiritual guy, and I think you've never actually read what the Bible says about David. If you read the Bible story about David, like if you're a mom, don't let your daughters marry anybody like David. He's a cheat, he's violent, he's vicious. David, why are these people the heroes of faith? If I asked you who are your heroes of faith, you'd probably come up with a squeakier, cleaner group of people. I, I, and the other thing about this list of the heroes of faith, it, it is all guys. Church always stumbles into this, right? We think about the men, the heroes of faith, our hymns today. This is my father's world faith of our fathers. The women outdo us every time. I mean, the men are put in the shade by the women when it comes to matters of faith. The author of Hebrews could have talked about who? Hannah, Miriam, a great host of women. I bet if I said to you, who's your hero of faith, you'd come up with a woman before you'd come up with a man, most of you. The thing about these heroes who are unheroic, this is always the way is that uh, heroes always have their shadow side, don't they? Like I grew up in America, and the person we align as, maybe above all others, is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, what a noble man, the author of freedom and the declaration of, he, he was amazing, Thomas Jefferson. But then we've learned that Thomas Jefferson, he had this hidden, dark side. They always do. Martin Luther King, great warrior for racial justice, he had a hidden, darker side. We, all of us, have a hidden, darker side. And it's why we always have to be vigilant about things. You know, the past couple of years, we, we've, we've talked a good bit here about race. And every now and then when I bring up race, somebody will say, don't talk about race. Been there, done that. We solved that years ago. It's not a problem anymore. Well, it may not be a problem for you anymore, but I know for me, when I look deep into my gut, I want to be sure that there's not some shadow, some residue of the way that I was raised and some of the stuff I've absorbed from the culture that when I look at somebody who looks different, I don't want anything in me to be anxious, to pass judgment. You always have to be vigilant with uh, all, all, all of that. The thing about these uh, unheroic heroes of the faith, uh, this is so interesting. Uh, he, he's using them as examples of faith. Not, not for one of these people does it say they had warm, fuzzy feelings about God. We kind of do that in America, like, oh, I have faith, I feel something. <laughs> for these people, faith is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not something in the gut that, that feels like anything at all. That's not what it is. These are not the people who uh, God answers their prayers. Like, they have so much faith. Like, if they have the volume of faith, God will answer prayers. God will do the stuff they want. If anything, so many of these people, their, their prayers weren't answered. Moses pleaded with God, let me go into the promised land. Nope. Nope. God doesn't answer their prayer. In fact, the people that I have known in my life who are the holiest, who are the wisest, who are the closest to God. Their prayers are not primarily or even very much asking God for favors. The people that I know who are closest to God, their prayers are just being with God, talking with God, listening to God, just sitting 
with God. That's what faith is for these unheroic heroes. It's just their life with God. There's no pressure on it. I love the way inspired Scripture <laughs> works. It'd be terrible, wouldn't it? If in Scripture you, you only saw like squeaky clean, perfect people who always did the right thing and they had no shadow side and they were just amazing, that'd be so much pressure, right? There wouldn't be room for people like for people like us. It's not a go thou and do likewise. It's here are broken, struggling people with dreams, and God is with them, and that is in fact the life of faith. If Hebrews defines uh, anything, it, it, it's this: it says that faith is the assurance of things hoped. For. And if I could sit down with you for a while, I think I'd like to ask you, what do you hope for? And I don't mean, what do you hope you're going to get for lunch today? Or what do you hope next week's going to be like? Or what do you hope next month will hold for you? But I mean, in your deepest gut, what, what is it that you hope for? What would be enough? And Hebrews defines it uh, with one word, home. Home. And for rootless people like us, I mean, where is home? I'm always trying to find home. I've told you these stories before. I was born in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, they've torn down the James Howell birthplace. That'd be like a great historic marker there, but it's not, not there. But I found the house that we lived in when my dad was in the Air Force. And I look at that house, and it's something cool to me about being there, but it's not, I don't want to buy that house and live in it again. I've been to my childhood home in Columbia where I grew up. I told you the story. I was looking at that house one day, standing in the yard, and the woman came out. I looked suspicious. I told her who I was. She invited me in. She gave me milk and cookies. It was great. Where's home? Where is home? Udo's ring, it's pretty interesting, he's from Germany. He found his dad's ring, they've been missing for 12 years, and his dad's been gone way longer. He's gotten that ring resized, and he's wearing it. I think that ring is taking him home. With that ring, he is again close to his dad, something his dad gave him. Where's home? How do we find home? Faith is about finding home, being at home with God, being at home with ourselves. Frederick Beatner wrote these wonderful words, no matter how much the world shatters us to pieces, we carry inside us a vision of wholeness that we sense is our true home and that beckons us. Faith is finding home. Kate Bowler did our women's retreat a couple of years, years ago, wrote a book that we all read and studied last year, tells about a man that she knew. Uh, he was at home sitting in his comfortable chair when uh, the news arrived that he had uh, an inoperable cancer and he only had a few months left to live. So his family was gathered with him, and they said, okay, Dad, what's your bucket list? Where do you want to go? Wherever you want to go, you name it anywhere in the world, we will take you there in the time that you have left. Where do you want to go? And this man said, mm, I'm good right here. I don't know how to react to that. Part of me thinks, how unimaginative can you be? I'd say, I want to go back to Rome. I want to go to Jerusalem again. I want to go. But maybe I want to be like him, that I'm already home. I'm good here. What all of these unheroic heroes of faith have in common is the following. Uh, Abraham, so interesting, uh, Hebrews narrates what we find, re-narrates what we find in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, God calls Abraham, and God comes to Abraham and says, Come and follow me. I will take you to a land that I will show you. That's not very good, is it? You think God would say, I want to take you to Ireland. And you'd think, oh, Ireland, that sounds terrific. I want to take you to, I don't know where, Las Vegas. Oh, that sounds cool. That would be fun to go to Las Vegas. I want to take you to, but instead, God just says, I want to take you to a land that I will show you. And if Abraham's got any sense, he's like, I ain't going till you tell me where it is and how it's going to turn out. Same thing happens with Jesus and the disciples. These guys are fishing. It is their business. Their families are there. And Jesus comes and says, follow me. <laughs> I 
Wait, how dumb can you be? They just drop everything and traipse off after him. I'd have asked a few questions. Like, where are we going? How's it going to turn out? How long are we going to be gone? But they just go. And maybe that's faith. And maybe that's why we don't feel so close to God. Because we ask so many questions. We've got to know how everything's going to turn out. We want it to be something that feels safe. And therefore, we never venture out for God. Father Greg Boyle works with uh, gang members, and they become former gang members quite often in California. He's a man of tremendous uh, compassion and vision. He's absolutely amazing. Here's what he wrote thinking about Hebrews 11 and what faith is. Listen to this. Faith isn't about saluting a set of beliefs. Faith is walking with Jesus, being his companion, and particularly standing in the lowly places with the easily despised and those who are readily left out. I've read that to myself over and over this week, and I'm going to read it to myself over and over this next week, and I would encourage you to do the same, because I suspect we miss out on God and feel hollowness in our gut and don't really know where home is or how to get there because we haven't gotten this yet. Let me read it to you again. Faith isn't saluting a set of beliefs. It's walking with Jesus, being his companion. And here's the kicker particularly standing in the lowly places with those who are easily despised and readily left out. That's the call. That's faith. That's our home. You know, there's so many issues that are in the world, and people debate whether we should talk about the issues of the world who we're in church or not. And some people say, we don't want to politicize things. The issues of the world, as best I can tell, all come down to that. Whether we're talking, you name it. Uh, race, pro-life, immigration, any issue that's out there in the world, it would all fall into place and it would be very easy, wouldn't it? If our vision was that faith isn't saluting a set of beliefs, but it's walking with Jesus, being his companion, and particularly standing in the lowly places with those who are easily despised and readily left out. It's a commitment to be with Jesus. Um, Udo found that ring. That's a cool thing. I'm wearing this ring. Uh, it's the only ring I've ever owned. This is the ring that Lisa placed. On. That's actually not true. I was, about to, I was about to tell you a falsehood. You don't want me to do that. I was going to say this is the ring that Lisa placed on my finger here at this altar on March the 1st of 1986. It really isn't. The ring she put on my finger then, I lost out in the yard one day. I had metal. I did everything. It's just gone forever. This is the replacement ring. It's just as good. It looks just like it. When she put this ring on my finger and I put one on her finger, what we were doing, what was that? We, you think you know how your life's going to turn out. You just have no idea. What we were doing is we said, like, we're, we're, we're in this together. I believe in you. I believe in us. I believe in God. I want our life somehow to be not just being bound to each other, but also bound to Jesus, to be his companion. And maybe especially, and here's what we got to work on like everybody else, with those who are despised, those that are easily left out. Faith. Uh, Martin Luther King, late in his life, told you this before, it's always worth uh, recalling. Later in his life, Martin Luther King, uh, frustrated by the slow progress of things, said, I am no longer optimistic, but I remain hopeful. I like that. I'm no longer optimistic, but I remain. Optimism, that's a, tomorrow's going to be a better day. Do you know people like that? Like they're having a bad day, but tomorrow's going to be a better day. And the fact is, sometimes tomorrow is a rottener day. And the question is, 
how can you be prepared if tomorrow is a rottener day? If you're optimistic, it's like, we're going to get our act together. We're going to make tomorrow a better day. That's what the optimist says. But the person of hope doesn't say it depends on us. It depends on God. The world is in God's hand. Hebrews 11 begins with God saying that God created the world, and then he called all these unheroic heroes to be near him in this project, right? God created something out of nothing. We look at that James Webb telescope. We're looking back in time to the darkness, the light, the wonder. God did that. <laughs> that universe is in God's hands. We are in God's hands. Tomorrow may be a better day. It may be a worse day. But we're not people of optimism. We are people of hope. We are people of hope. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. In faith, we say, I'm going to be Jesus' companion. My future is in his hands. I'll go, I don't know where. <laughs> I don't know how it'll turn out. But I want to be with him. I want to be with him morning by morning. New mercies we see. Thanks be to God.